This lesson covers statistical power. By the end of this lesson, you will be able to define the different types of errors in hypothesis testing. You'll be able to define statistical power and describe the factors that affect it. And you'll be able to explain how sample size and effect size influence power. Finally, you'll be able to describe how to implement a power analysis and carry it out in your own research. Let's return to the decision framework that we, we use in hypothesis testing. There is truth, either the null hypothesis is true or it is false, and then there's the decision we make on the basis of our statistical test. We either reject the null hypothesis or we fail to reject the null hypothesis. Remember that a type 1 error is defined as rejecting the null hypothesis when in fact it is true. A type 2 error is when we do not reject the null hypothesis when in fact we should because it is false. What we're going to focus on in this lesson is that cell in the table that says power. That's when we reject the null hypothesis when in fact we should because it is false. When we compute statistical power, we use the same idea of this envisioning a bunch of replications of our statistical procedure. Remember that with the sampling distribution of the mean, we imagined drawing a random sample from the population, computing the mean, and then repeating that process a bunch of times. That would give us a distribution of sample means that we could use to compute a p-value. We do the same thing with statistical power, except that when we draw samples, we don't draw them from the distribution under the null hypothesis. We draw samples under the distribution for the alternative hypothesis. And so we imagine this process of drawing a sample from the alternative distribution and computing the mean. If we decide to reject the null hypothesis based on that value, then we count it. And we repeat that procedure a bunch of times, and then power just gives us the proportion of times that we rejected the null hypothesis when we should have rejected the null hypothesis. Let's look at an example. Here we have a distribution where the null hypothesis is that the mean is less than or equal to 10. We're going to test this hypothesis against an alternative that the mean is greater than 10. Using an alpha level of 0 0.05, we can obtain the critical value. The blue line in the figure represents the critical value. Any value of our test statistic that is equal to or greater than this value will lead us to reject the null hypothesis. In order to compute power, we have to translate this critical value from the null distribution to the alternative distribution. To obtain the alternative distribution, we have to compute a non-centrality parameter, lambda. This parameter is a function of the effect size, delta, and the sample size n. The alternative distribution is going to diverge from the null distribution as either the effect size or sample size increases. Increasing either one of those is going to increase the non-centrality parameter. Once we have the non-centrality parameter, we can translate the critical value from the null distribution to a value on the alternative distribution. We then look at the area above this value on the alternative distribution to obtain statistical power. Note that these procedures only apply for an upper tail test. Statistical power is affected by the significance level, effect size, and sample size. As any of these things increase, power will increase. However, of these three items, sample size is the only one that's really under your control. Depending on your budget and the type of population you're studying, you have a choice about how many participants to include in your study. You have very little choice over the effect size. There are some experimental manipulations you can use to increase the effect size, but for the most part, you don't have the ability to control the effect size. You can choose significance levels that will lead to an increase in power. However, as you deviate from the conventional 0 0.05, you'll have a much harder time justifying that choice. It's best to leave the significance level at conventional levels such as 0 0.05.
To get a better understanding of the way effect size influences power, let's look at an animation. In this figure, you see the null distribution with the critical value and alpha level marked. It's a little bit harder to see, but there's also an alternative distribution in this figure. The alternative distribution and the null distribution are actually the same because the effect size is set to zero. When the animation begins, you'll see what happens to these two distributions as the effect size increases. You'll also see a shaded blue region, which represents power. This will let you see what happens to power as the effect size increases. It's evident in this last figure that the effect size represents the discrepancy between the null and alternative hypothesis. As the effect size increases, the two distributions shift away from each other. This causes an increase in power. Sample size is another factor that influences power, and this factor is under your control. Let's look at another animation to see what happens as sample size increases. Power increased as expected as sample size increased, but the way it works is different from the effect size. The sample size does not cause the distributions to shift away from each other. Rather, increasing the sample size decreases sampling variability, so the sampling distribution becomes more concentrated around the population mean. This makes the distinction between the null distribution and alternative distribution more clear. Now that we have seen how statistical power analysis works, it's important to understand when to conduct a power analysis. A power analysis should always be done ahead of time in the planning phase of your experiment. You should never do it after you collect data. Never conduct a power analysis after you have collected data and conducted your hypothesis test. After you've done your test, you have either rejected or failed to reject the null hypothesis, and power is either zero or one. It makes no sense to conduct a power analysis after you have collected data. Only use it during the planning phase to help you identify the sample size you need to have a reasonable chance of detecting a difference that exists. Aside from the mathematics, the way you conduct a power analysis is to look at the literature and identify a range of plausible effect sizes that other researchers have found. Use this information as input into your power analysis. Also take into account your budget. How many participants can you actually afford to include in your study? A power analysis is, is rarely done just once. You actually compute power analysis multiple times. You might do it for different levels of effect sizes and a range of sample sizes. A variety of power computations will help you plan your study. If you are unable to achieve the level of power you desire, you can do a variety of things. You can increase your budget to include more participants, or you may change the experimental manipulation to cause a larger effect size. There are also some experimental designs that are more powerful than others. For example, a match pairs design will have more power than an independent samples t-test. All of these things should be considered when planning your study.